Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Yeah. More candid, lively discussions of law and social justice issues. And we have with us today, yeah. Professor Emerita Cornelia Randall from the University of Dayton School of Law. And now residing in Florida, we have visiting professor and, and professor emeritus from University of Toledo School of Law, now visiting at Washington and Lee School of Law, Ben Davis in Charlottesville, Virginia, and former Hawaii Lieutenant Governor and Attorney General Doug Chin here in downtown Honolulu. So welcome aboard, folks. Today is the start date for the House hearings on the January 6th insurrection and whatever they may cover. Let's, well, ladies first, Professor Randall, what can we look for from this, if anything? I don't think, I think not a whole lot of substance. I think that it'll be designed so everybody gets to say something on the camera, some talking point on the camera. There may, there may be some kind of report or something. I doubt there's going to be a report, but I don't see this as a, the, they, they tend, in my opinion, not to be designed. House committee meetings don't, aren't really designed to hold people to the fire and really educate the public. It's designed more to give the politicians an opportunity to say something uh, on an issue that is important to Americans and constituents. So I have no hope that it's going to be anything but a show. Hey, Ben. Well, I'd like to use a line from one of Kevin Hart's videos, which is that it's about to go down, okay? That meaning that you're, whatever it's going to be, is going to start to happen live in prime time. And I think that there are a couple of things that should be kept in mind. First is the optics of the January 6th committee. When you look at the committee, which is both Democrats and Republicans, and it's a, 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 a wealth of diverse Americans on that panel. And to anybody who's used to watching the Watergate hearings many years ago, one of the things that would strike you about the Watergate hearings was, guess what? All white guys. And so in this sense, it's a really different look than something that even us old farts like me can remember. And I think that that's a very powerful message in itself. Secondly, that it's uh, Democrats and Republicans, and in particularly Liz Cheney, who is kind of coming from uh, Republican royalty that is there, um, is also a, a, another aspect of it. Now, what they do and what they say, they're obviously going to be working very hard to make it compelling for all of us. And of course, on the other side, uh, the people who are standing with Donald Trump are going to be trying to do counter-programming. They're not going to show it on Fox, all that kind of stuff to keep people in the dark. So this is the old American game, right? Which is to basically keep people in the dark like mushrooms and throw manure on them on one side, and then on the other side, an endeavor to try to bring truth forward and bring light. Will that work? I don't know. Is this political? Absolutely. And I, any of those people who are there are politicians. And they want to get reelected if they're up for election and, and, and all the rest of that. So that's all there. But even within all those different sort of things that we think about, I think it's important to understand that this is going to be something that is going to be very, very deep to watch, to watch what they put out there. What I'm waiting to see is whether they're going to point the finger at Donald Trump is part of what they do. Not just the people around him, they're going to actually point the finger at Donald Trump being in the middle, at the, at the center of this whole thing, basically or whether they're going to once again shy away because of this weird uh, fear of uh, somehow backlash or a weird fear of sort of uh, impugning the presidency and not, and, and, not, and not go after the actual person. You know, 
the presidency is one thing, the person and what they did is another thing. And from what we're seeing from the judges is that there's a lot that was going on that does not fit within either the presidential uh, uh, powers that are there or even within the attorney-client privilege with fraud exception types of uh, uh, being recognized for a number of the exchanges between John Eastman and uh, probably President Trump. So, you know, it, it, we're right there. And let's see what happens. So, Doug, you've been a prosecutor. <clears throat> From your perspective as a prosecutor, how would you present this to try and be as effective, persuasive, and credible as possible? First of all, I wanted to say that there's just been a few times in, in my life uh, when I felt like I was watching the TV, um, seeing what was happening in, in real time, and um, just not believing that I was even seeing what I was seeing. Uh, so what really jumps out to me, uh, of course, is I, when I was a lot younger than uh, when the assassination attempt on, on President Reagan, I remember when that all unfolded, how, how shocking that was to see everything happening then. 9-11, um, no question. You know, I mean, that, that was very shocking. Um, but I think January 6th of last year, that ranks right up there with me as well. Um, you know, just the shock of seeing um, people entering into the Capitol, uh, just the, the crowds of people that were running through the hallways, and uh, the chance to hang the vice president. Uh, yeah, I think that was all very, very significant at the same time as uh, Congress was all next door, you know, huddled and in, in it's, I, I mean, I, I think the whole thing was very, very shocking. Um, so as a prosecutor, uh, I think the, the goal for uh, today's hearing and the, and the series of hearings that's, that are gonna happen is to really try to bring something new to the public that will connect the dots uh, between sort of the crowd and the mayhem uh, that occurred there in, in, in the Capitol and the people at the highest levels. Um, that would be a success. Um, I think if it's just kind of a, a rehash of, of what happened without, uh, without being able to really connect sort of the crowd to um, people at the top, uh, giving direction and, and or, or approving of this or, or saying that this should happen. Um, I think you need that. Otherwise, it's just too easy to um, to be able to dismiss as this was just something that um, that took place that uh, was unfortunate, but involved other people um, in, 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 instead of the people that, that really matter. So Mark Meadows, President Trump, uh, you know, people who were um, the, the Trump family um, or a certain key uh, congressman. Um, I think that's probably what I would be looking for as a prosecutor. And that's a good insight. Is there really any question in your mind that there was a group of people, including people in very high positions of political leadership, that actively concerted and worked to try to reverse the election results for the presidency and keep Trump in office? Is that really in question? Uh, it's, it's not a, I'll, I'll say speak first. It's not a question for me at all, but I think because of the polarization of where people are at, um, I, I think what is going to be really important is, is a smoking gun, you know, something that's very, very uh, tangible, uh, that is uh, very obvious, that there's even something that people hadn't seen already. Um, I, I think that would be the, the, the most hopeful uh, sign of being able to change anything. I totally get um, you know, what, uh, what we're talking about when we're saying that in, in many ways, um, this could just be a show um, that really will not change people's minds. I'm talking about uh, what it would take to uh, possibly move the needle. And I think it would take something like that. Uh, otherwise, we're just, we're, we are in a place where people are just going to stay, remain within their uh, opinions that they have now. If it's, if it's just circumstantial evidence, words that could be open up to interpretation, I, there's no doubt in my mind that starting at Trump and going all the way down through his administration, some of his people engaged in helping him to try to uh, stay uh, overthrow the results of the election. The problem is that Everything they've talked about so far in terms of what's been put out there has been 
things that you could open up for interpretation, you know, in terms of saying, well, you know, yeah, he, he, he said uh, maybe Mike Pence ought to be hanged. Hey, but he was joking. And, and, and without something in writing, without something that actually, where you could hear the tone of his tone of voice, hear how he is saying that uh, people are gonna hear what they wanna hear and see what they wanna see. And, and that means that uh, I don't know, I don't know what, I, I think I agree. I think there needs some, some concrete, kind of evidence are that could change, move the needle, but I don't know that they will get that because I think they would have gotten it had they had by this time. And maybe they have it. I mean, maybe this is what tonight's going to be about. Yeah. Is yeah. telling people what they got. Well, well you know, I, I heard at one point somebody talk about this to be looked at as a spoken wheel conspiracy with at the center of it being uh, President Trump, and then you have sort of the people around him, and then they're working with other people. The thing that I think, I hope get, gets emphasized is that it's not just the focus on what happened on the day, January 6th, but of all the machinations that were put forward in what was essentially a coup plot, or self-coup, so to speak, at least that's the way it looks to me. What I mean by that is that if they can trace out the links with people in the executive, the legislative, and I will go so far with the Ginny Justice Thomas uh, tandem in the judiciary uh, at the federal level and at the state level in terms of the efforts of, the, of people at the state levels to bring in the quote unquote alternative fraudulent electors and people willing to sign off on those as just one piece of that and can tie it up with some of the voting rights uh, uh, efforts to suppress the voting rights as part of the big lie and see this whole package. If they can bring that whole package together in a way that is clear and then point the finger at the heart of it, which is this is the, the coup that is ongoing inside the United States right now and that all Americans who believe in our democracy would have to uh, be confronted with. Personally, I think that that would be already something, even though there will be counter-programming, even though there will be the spin masters on various sides that will try to, the point, the, to try to play with it. The point to me is that, that the words are said, the words are there for history, that they are shown, they are explained, as best as can be at this point in time. And we can have the spin masters and, and the, you know, the, the, the others who will try to play games with it and all that. But I want people to hear so that they can kind of look at what the spin masters say and look at what's said in the meat in it and have that sense, I think, inside of us of, am I hearing truth? Am I hearing truthiness to take the old Stephen Colbert thing? Or am I hearing uh, some kind of spinning? Right, and that's the worry I have is that there's such an orientation to do spin in these kinds of events by the commentators who gather around to look at what happened that the essence of the incredibly dangerous thing that was tried to be done by Trump and his uh, by Trump and his acolytes, and that, that is still ongoing right now, uh, uh, is something that uh, you know Americans should be made aware of, even in all the hard life that people are dealing with, all the things like high gas prices and all that, that people will get it. Now, one of the things that I hope they can do is come up with a 25 words or less summary, right? Like the theory of the case, right? That they give at the beginning, that is just very straightforward, words of one syllable that make people understand that all the evidence, all the spin mastery, all that stuff, can be boiled down into this was a coup and President Trump led it. Something as simple as that, and then just bring the pieces together to make the argument afterward. That would be quite something. Chuck, if it's okay, I, I wanted to also make a comment about how, uh, just like how to bring it back into our, our state and why it's important for us 
um, watching from Hawaii uh, in terms of what, what really happened. I think so one thing I think that's really important what Professor Davis was just talking about is just putting out a record. Like in other words, this, this show is called The Rule of Law. <laughs> so, um, so in terms of just being able to establish a record of, that will go into the books, uh, you know, whatever happens, you know, for good or bad in our, in our future, um, there, there is a record of, of what's happened. And I think that's something that we should try to uh, find some hope in. Um, but I think the other thing that I think about for Hawaii is that, uh, you know, we're essentially, this, this is about election, election integrity, right? It's about, um, it's about the states uh, casting their votes for, for president. Uh, Hawaii, uh, it's traditionally a one-party state. It reliably uh, casts its small number of electoral votes for uh, one party, uh, that, and that's just how it always works out. And we always do it at the very, very end because we're the last ones to finish voting. Um, so we are just reliably set in a certain direction. Um, and what I what I think is so interesting to hear from the the other commentators that you have on the show is that they're from Ohio and Florida and Virginia, which are you know total swing states, like like places where uh, where the the votes. I don't want to say they they matter more. Uh, but they but they certainly are very relevant in terms of what the underlying talk about election integrity is all about. Um, and so I, I got to be honest, sometimes I feel a little helpless uh, just because I feel like, you know, we're, we're voting a certain way. Uh, but then in the meantime, you have all these states um, that are setting up structures um, that could be very dangerous to yeah. integrity. And, and so um, and so if anything, I think for those of us in Hawaii who are watching this, uh, we want to be able to know that the record is being protected, but I think the other thing is that we also want this to go into our memories because to whatever extent um, that we have a voice just as much as everybody else does uh, in the other 49 states, um, then, then we want to be able to speak up and, and, um, and, and really call for election integrity um, and to call for democracy. So, um, so I think that's why it's important for people in Hawaii. But one of the things that I think, okay, I, I, I absolutely agree with, about the uh, with you uh, about attorney attorney Jan Ten, uh, everything you said. Well, I guess what depresses me is I am in Florida. Right, Florida is a crazy state. It ain't a swing state. It is. It is a solidly Republican swing state. That is passing all. It's got a pub Republican legislature. Now we might be swinging in terms of presidency, but I'm not even sure I would say that. And it's 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 hard to know. I mean, the record is important. I absolutely agree. A record is important. 25 years from now, a clear record of what happened. Uh, is is going to be important, but we're so we're not taking steps to kind of really deal with the current situation outside of the insurrection. We haven't really done anything about the voting, all the different voting laws that are being passed. We haven't really done anything about the census and how it has undercounted. Uh, uh, every group except white. Uh, it, it's undercounted black and brown and Asian and Native American Indian groups. And it seems to me that one thing that the administration could do is say, since the census is so important to the election, to uh, funding, and since it's so undercounted, we are going to say that it can't, that it's got to be redone. Uh, even if it's redone after this voting year. But we're sort of accepting the census with the undercounting. Like, so that means 10 years of underrepresentation mm -hmm. for all these groups because it'll be 10 years before it's counted as good. Uh, I think the insurrection, dealing with the insurrection is important and putting it on the record is important, but I, I'm not, I don't think it's the most important thing on my list. Uh, I, I, you know, cause I think that, uh, that there's all these other things that, uh, that are happening behind the scenes that are weakening the 
the federal government and 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 all of these if you're in a conservative state you know you they really are going hog wild in oppression of rights yeah and so i, I live in uh virginia now and i lived in uh ohio before so and i lived in ohio for a long time when ohio was a swing state uh used to be called and uh, toledo where i was was the swingiest part of the swing state in the sense that uh what the way toledo balanced out between the suburbs and the city would probably dictate how it was Hawaii was going to go, which would be with the results that the Democrats or Republicans could win. And as everyone knows, the Republicans typically can never win without Ohio. So it, that's how intense a place it is. And um, Renelia is, ap uh, Professor Randall is exactly right about the machinations with regards to voting going on. Um, they're gerrymandering of a level that probably has never been seen before. I know it's particularly brutal in Florida, but I know in Ohio, the representative that I've had as either a congressperson uh, or, um, you know, has varied somewhat by gerrymandering efforts to basically split the Democratic core from uh, into pieces so that the, uh, a Republican would have a greater chance of winning. Right now, you have a, a Congresswoman Marcy Kaptur, who's a very distinguished senior uh, a member of the House who is in a district that's been basically carved in a way, she's running against one of these ultra MAGA guys named Majewski, you know, with his big Trump sign painted into his ground, right? Now, I think that that is really bizarre that somebody would try to run in a district, but they're figuring that they could make it because of the way it's been gerrymandered against her. That being said, I would just like to make a shout out to Congresswoman Kaptur she takes no prisoner okay when she when you run against her and i think that one of the things that needs to be done by those uh who are uh taking actions with regards to the elections coming up is that the attitude has to be to take no prisoners meaning you have to hang on the necks of these people who are these crazies and i call them that they're just crazies they're Americans like me and all, but they're still crazy because they're not in touch with reality. Got to hang on their neck. All of the darkness that we're going to hear about tonight has to hang on the necks of all those politicians who are playing along for whatever reason they want. Whatever that, you know, as part of their acquiescing because their donors are telling them that's the way they got to dance. Okay, whatever they're doing, hang it on Gomert's neck. Hanging on Gosar's neck, hanging on uh, uh, Gates's neck, hanging on DeSantis's neck. Got to be hung on them about this kind of effort to put forward a coup in the United States that we will not tolerate. And we're going to do things, obviously, part of this has got to be a deal with everybody's problems and try to work with them. But you got to hang the evil on the neck of the evil doer, is what I'm saying. And that, and and if if you if you're not willing to do that, at least to me personally, then you know you're kind of acquiescing to it, and it's a dangerous game to acquiesce to these real kind of scary, evil people. They will bully you into the ground, as we've seen in many times in this history. So, but what do I know? You know, <laughs> you know. So, Doug, if you could make this case these hearings about election integrity, how would you connect that to election choices and the importance of that connection? Well, I think it's, it's that's actually a great point, is that, uh, you know, on, on one hand, you're just talking about a narrative of an insurrection. I mean, there was mayhem and chaos. That was terrible. Um, but I, I think, uh, artfully, if, if the people who are running the committee can be able to make this a discussion about election integrity. That's actually something to really watch for. Yeah. Uh, because if that becomes the, the topic, uh, rather than who was directing someone to storm the Capitol and who allowed all this to happen, I, I think that'll actually make a, a big difference and be, and be helpful in the long run, um, because I think that's what we're all concerned about, even in Hawaii, uh, with our electoral votes that, that we have uh, that get cast at the very, very end. Uh, you know, okay. we care about democracy uh, and, and our votes counting 
and, and everybody's votes count. I would like to say that watching people vote, because I've been a poll watcher several times when I was in Ohio, is one of the most moving experiences as a poll watcher is people go and stand there and, you know, put their ballot together and put it, all kinds of people, you know, and, and it's very moving. And I have a lot of respect for the poll workers who sit there and volunteer to do those, uh, to, to, to run those and try to be fair and neutral. There'll be Democrats and Republicans together. If we're gonna have in here people who are gonna try to sneak into those poll worker roles or essentially radicals trying to upset people in their voting, that is a thing that we have to make sure does not, that is nipped in the bud by at, at, at each poll place, literally having maybe some poll place workers having to be kicked out if they're not gonna act in the neutral way that makes it meaningful for those votes to be counted and all that. And we can talk also about the, laws being put in place to mess up the way that people can vote and you know like you have to put the date in and the things under the flap and all these kind of games to try to reduce votes that's a whole nother level but on the day of in-person voting that people will be treated with the dignity and respect that they are entitled to for doing one of the things that i personally found the, one of the most moving things to watch three or four times i was a poll watcher And in our last minute here, how would you do that? How would you connect the election integrity issues that the insurrection raises to the motivation to get out there and defend those? I think the Ginny Thomas texts are quite incriminating. Yeah. And by that, I mean the wife of one of our U.S. Supreme Court justices. Yes. It's not to put too fine a point on that. No, I think that's right. And, and, and we don't, it's kind of gone and passed by as if it, you know, never happened. And it really needs to be brought up. And, uh, and maybe, you know, have, are they planning to call her before the committee? Probably I, not. I don't know, but I would go farther and say that that one dissent in that 8 1 case that was about the election stuff, that uh, Justice Thomas was a sole dissenting member of the Supreme Court. Now that we know afterward that was uh, going on with his wife, that I find really troubling. I think that's a real problem that in terms of recusal, a basic element of recusal, you know. Well, but, I know this is not going to happen, but Congress, because at every opportunity that they have had an opportunity to pass ethics laws, they have exempted the Supreme Court, which has been a mistake. The, the Supreme Court and con well, that's a whole nother, Congress tends to exempt themselves as well. Uh, right. but, uh, but, uh, but they could go in and, uh, and, and make the Supreme Court subject to the same ethic rules that every other justice in the federal government is under. Uh, and uh, so that when people want them to recuse themselves, there's an ethical basis for them having to explain why their behavior is not against rule number 1258. Yeah. But right now, all we have to say is we believe you ought to recuse yourself. And they say, well, I believe I don't. And that's in the discussion because there's no rules that really cover their behavior. But as into the election thing, I really feel like that. I don't, I, you know, with the, the conservative Democrats in the Senate, I don't see us being able to get rid of filibuster, which is what would be needed in order to pass the kind of, of election protection, voting protect, not just voting rights, but like you said, election protection. And they're passing the opposite kind of bills down here in Florida. They are passing bills authorizing people to police stations over and beyond the election worker so that they can go in and challenge someone's vote, uh, even though they're not the authorized election worker. So, yeah. 
And I well, if I can just add one thing, just let me add one thing, which Make is that the enough. unintended yeah. consequence of that will be that there will be people who will go in there and will challenge the challenger. Because I've seen challengers be kicked out for acting badly in elections. So you know, you've got to have a team on both sides that's willing to go in and, and take no prisoners when somebody's going to act irresponsibly in not respecting the dignity of the ordinary citizen voter when they are trying to vote. I'm just going to, sorry to jump in. I'm sorry. Oh, and we're out of time for today. Thank you all so much. Thank you. I'm focusing on election integrity, election choices, and ethics and values is a great way to wrap this one up. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.